Oh, thank you, everybody. I have noon, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with my pre-presentation chat here. I am so excited to welcome you all to the kickoff of the conference pre-conference with Hungry Hungry Space Hippos, a journey further into the ever-expanding universe of how holds work in Evergreen. I hope we are all excited for a deep dive today because I'm sure it's going to be a good one. Uh, and uh, I just want to let everybody know that the way that we're handling the moderated sessions is that we will have the session presenters with audio and video sharing and then everyone all the questions and stuff will be handled through the chat and so that is the way we're going to handle that'll be pretty consistent throughout the rest of the conference um, and I want to thank our sponsors in particular the platform sponsor helping us have hop in here the evergreen community development initiative as well as Mobius for uh, sponsoring our captioning. If you would like to view the live, caption live captioning brought to us today, uh, then you can go to that link that I have just put in the chat and we'll transcribe us as we go along. And thank you to Sherry, who's our captioner here with us today. And then Cool, the Consortium of Ohio Libraries, is our pre-conference sponsor. For it. So thank you to them for sponsoring this part of the conference. If anybody has any questions, definitely go ahead and put it in the chat. And lacking any other questions or updates, I will go hand ahead and hand it over to Angela Kilsdunk, Andrea Bunsneeman, and Mike Rylander for their presentation. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. And we're going to go ahead and get started. So I have the first set of slides. So welcome to Hungry Hungry Space Hippos, um, a journey, journey further into the ever expanding universe of how holds work in Evergreen. Um, this has been a labor of love on the part of Angela, Mike and myself. And I really hope that by the end of this presentation, you get a good in, good information and that you're not too overwhelmed by the intricacies of holds. So um, this is the outline of what we'll be covering today. I'll do some introduction, um, this introductory material. I'll go over a couple of the top holds myths um, and some definitions of terms that we're going to encounter. Then we'll be uh, looking at a holds a typical holds workflow um, from a title holds perspective and what it's kind of doing in the background in evergreen as those various steps happen then we'll take a pretty deep uh, look into holds configuration options and the different ways you can influence that and then we've got some additional resources at the end of our slides for you uh, next thank you forgot to ask that last time um, so why hungry hungry space hippos so back in 2011, um, Mike, who's with us today, and our former colleague, Grace Dunbar, gave uh, one of the first, if not the very first, public presentation devoted to the beautiful mystery of Evergreen's holds functions. Um, and Grace framed this overview of the hold functionality with a story from Disney's Animal Park Safari. Uh, as the story goes, the safari, tra uh, the safari group kept getting distracted by what was in the past, what was in the future, and was missing what was right in front of them. At one point, the guide said, giraffes are in the future, we're in the now, and hippos are the now. Ostriches are the past, giraffes are the future, we're in the now with the hippos. So this presentation gave us that infamous swim lane graphic uh, that most of us know, which is a classic, but doesn't really reflect current functionality. It's been many years since uh, the community has revisited Hold's behavior in a comprehensive manner at a uh, conference, and a lot has changed since then. So we knew that there was a big knowledge gap here, we wanted to dig in deeply and give you a new overview of what is to many a pretty obscure process. So we wanted to talk about today's hippos, 2021 space hippos, if you will. While uh, we were discussing this idea for proposal, Mike mused the quote on the slide and thus hungry, hungry space hippos was born. Next. So um, we want just to set some managing expectations here. Uh, holds are hard. This is something that is a watchword um, in evergreen development. And this is a lot of content, so don't expect to retain it all the first time. You will notice that we violated one of the uh, key presentation rules of slides, which is we put a lot of text on these slides. And the idea is that these were written to be used as later reference. So 
we'll mostly also be focusing on stock and generic examples for title level holds um, because if we went into all the different things about holds, we would literally be here for a week. And for Q&A, um, we're going to ask you to put questions into the chat. Um, we're going to pause at certain points in the presentation and answer as many questions as we can, but we, it, we tend, potentially won't get to all of them, and we really can't answer specific like configuration questions because we won't really have time. So next slide. Top holds myths. Next slide. So myth number one, the Q position is real. Um, we all have seen the Q position and think that that is canonical. Um, the Q position actually reflects the order in which holds were placed. It may not, in fact, be at all analogous to the order in which they will be filled, but this is a good thing because they're often filled in a more effective way than just the straight first in, first out of the queue. First in, first out is an option, but it's not necessarily a, a good op option for libraries, um, except in some really limited cases. The second myth is the holds list. The holds pull list is canonical, static, and meaningful. In actuality, you can think of a holds list um, kind of like that Brian Greene uh, Mysteries of the Universe analogy, where the universe is a loaf of bread. In this case, the holds potential list is the loaf of bread. And the slice of the bread is our view of space time, or in this case, the slice of the bread is the holds pull list at a specific time in a specific location. When the holds pull list is run, what's on that list represents what the best option to fill current active holds given the pre-existing state of all of the holds. So in a busy system, it is pretty likely that your holds list might be outdated almost as soon as it's printed. If you have this habit of printing out your hold list and then pulling it three hours later, break that habit. Myth number three is proximity. Um, a lot of times people seem to think proximity means geographic distance. And in Evergreen, proximity actually refers to organizational proximity, the distance between organizational units. And we'll get pretty deep into this later. There are ways to model uh, different scenarios and different arrangements of proximity. Uh, next slide. All right, so some definitions. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but just be aware that these are some of the concepts that we're gonna be talking about. On this slide, um, some of these terms should be familiar to you. For the most part, what I wanna call attention to for what we're gonna be talking about today is org unit, um, organizational unit OU is a specific consortium library system or library branch. Um, YAUS, if you hear us say YAUS, that stands for yet another org unit setting. It is community slang for library settings and the plural is YAUSEN. And then as mentioned in the previous slide, there's also proximity, um, which is organizational distance. Next. And here is a little chart um, where the hippo is, is our home library, BR2. And then the red numbers are showing the proximity, the default proximity um, between each BR2 and each of the other locations. So you're counting both up and down the org tree. And we'll come back to this graphic in a little bit when we show, talk about different ways to adjust that. But this is what unadjusted proximity looks like by itself. OK, next. For hold types, um, we will mostly be talking about title holds today. Um, for uh, our purposes, you can think of meta record holds as making the universe of potential copies bigger. Um, and then the other types of non-title holds are making the potential copies, uh, universe of potential copies smaller, including several that are for one specific copy. We will talk briefly about force and recall as special holds types. And just so you know, in the code column, that's if you're looking in the interface, um, there's a hold type column um, and it has a, a one letter code and that's what all of those map to. So again, this is some of these are definitely future reference uh, slides. Next. Um, and then there's hold states. So these are the different states um, that a hold can be in. We will, uh, for most of today, we'll be talking about targeting and capturing. So the key point here is to remember that targeted hold is Evergreen has identified an item that can potentially fill the hold. And the uh, captured hold is an item has been scanned in and assigned to a specific hold. Next. And then finally, system related holds info. You'll hear us gonna be hearing us talk a lot about the potentials list, um, which is also known as hold copy map. This is given a set of rules. This is a list of items that can possibly fill a hold. There is a 
uh, partner list to this that we realized that there wasn't really a term for this, so we invented one. And we decided to call it the candidate holds list. This is the holds view of that same hold copy map. So given a set of rules and checks, the candidate holds list is a list of holds that an item can possibly fill. As I mentioned before, the holds pull list is a specific subset of the holds potentials list. Best hold selection sort order is a set of rules that Evergreen uses to figure out the best item for a hold to fill. And we're going to talk really extensively about this later. Age protection keeps new items um, local as defined by proximity for a certain period of time. So this is a way to keep new items close to home. And then opportunistic capture. If an item is checked in um, at an Evergreen location and it can fill a local hold, the item in hand, so the book that you have in hand, will fill the hold even if another item is already targeted for that hold. And that's something that people can sometimes be confused about. But this is just another way that Evergreen is always looking for the best copy to fill the hold. Uh, next. So for best hold selection sort order, um, the really short version of this is that it's uh, answering the question, what is important to your library when ordering, as in arranging, uh, putting holds in order to be filled? So this is a way that you can say, OK, it's more important for me that my patrons get copies first or that we're minimizing transits or things like that. Um, Evergreen comes with seven pre-configured best hold orders to choose from. Um, and you can also create new ones. So for those of you that aren't familiar with these, just as a note, um, FIFO, uh, FIFO stands for first in, first out. And it is an option, but it's not necessarily always the best option for sorting holds, but it is there. So let's go ahead and um, I'm going to hand it over now to Mike to talk about hold workflow. Actually, I think we're going to go over to me next morning, everyone. Sorry. No, that's all right. Um, all right, so we are going to, as Andrea said, walk through a basic hold workflow. So this is, this is where we're really going to start to get into it. Um, we're going to take a look at placing a hold, targeting, or creating the potentials list, the pull list, and hold capture. And at each step of the way, we're going to take a deep dive into what exactly Evergreen is doing and checking and cross-checking to determine which items are eligible to fill holds and which hold is the best to fill with a particular item. Um, as Andrea said, there are a lot of configuration options that affect holds in Evergreen. So one of our goals with this presentation is to identify and clarify which configuration options are coming into play at each step of the holds process. Um, these next few slides are going to focus on the workflow. And then the next section of this presentation is going to cover all of those configure option, configuration options in more detail. So we're taking a look at the very beginning, placing a hold. We want to know what is Evergreen actually doing when a user clicks place hold. So we've got some diagrams to walk through together today, along with a lot of text. Um, take a look at the diagrams with me today. And then if you come back to these slides later on, that text is there for you to reference. So if we start at the hippo, <laughs> the hold is requested. Um, at this point, Evergreen wants to determine as quickly as possible whether the hold can be placed because all we need to give the user right away in that instant is confirmation of whether their hold can be placed or not. So to do this, Evergreen is going to look for just one item that could fill that hold. We don't need to know the best item to fill it. We just want to know that an item exists and is eligible to fill the hold. So in the first step, that hold place button is clicked. Evergreen is going to identify all the possible items that could fill the hold. And that kind of takes us to this offshoot of the diagram on the right hand side. Here, Evergreen is looking at boundaries, both hard and soft boundaries, any that might be set in those library settings. Um, and these boundaries that, excuse me, these boundaries restrict where Evergreen should look for items that are eligible. So they might tell Evergreen to stop at the branch or at the system or say it's okay to look out into the entire consortium. 
It's then going to take all of those items and order them by proximity. It's going to order them from nearest to farthest away based on proximity. And so we have a proximity ordered list of all of the items at that point. Coming back to the main diagram, Evergreen is going to then take that ordered list and test each item in proximity order to determine if there is an item that could fill the hole. So that takes us into the loop here, is the item eligible? At this point in the workflow, once Evergreen finds a single item that could fill that hold, it is going to report back to the user that yes, your hold has been placed. Um, if it doesn't find an item, um, or let's say the first item it tests isn't eligible, it's just going to go around and test each of those items in the list. If it doesn't find one, it tells the user that they can't place that hold for whatever reason. So at this step, just when the user is waiting for that feedback, whether or not they can place this hold, the big question for us, I think, is what exactly is Evergreen checking to determine if an item is eligible to fill that hold? So there's a variety of criteria that Evergreen is checking. And there's a function called action hold request permit test um, that it runs to test a variety of criteria. It's going to look at things related to the patron, to the items, as well as hold policy tests. Um, so with these next few slides, we're going to take a look at everything that is being checked. And these are important because this is actually the same eligibility check that Evergreen is going to use at the different steps in this process. So when we create the potentials list and when we capture items for holds, anytime Evergreen is checking whether items are eligible, it's going to go through these same checks that we're going to look at right now. So first we have the patron tests. Um, Evergreen does some basic sanity checking. Does the patron account that for which the hold is being placed exist? Is it still there? Um, it's also going to look at factors such as whether the patron is barred or if they have a penalty on their account that blocks them from placing a hold. Those things, of course, um, can also result in a hold not being allowed or not being placed. So it checks the patron and whether they're eligible to place this hold. After that, um, we can think about a variety of item eligibility tests or item tests. Again, some sanity checking. Um, does the item being checked exist? Um, Evergreen will also check if the item is marked as holdable. So that's doing a check of the item record and the holdable flag that we see there in the item record. It will also look at the status and the shelving locations that the item is in. So it's checking for that information in the item record and also cross-checking against the configurations for the status and the shelving location. We want to see if that particular status and shelving location is configured to be holdable. Evergreen will also check for age protection on the item to see if it could transit to fill the hold if that's needed. And it will also look at the library setting called skip for hold targeting to see if the item circulating library has that set to true. If it is true, of course, we would want to skip those items and they would not be eligible. And then lastly, Evergreen also checks hold policies to determine if an item can fill the hold being placed. So it will look for a hold policy that matches the transaction it finds one, it will test if that policy actually allows holds. If the policy has max holds set within it, it will also check to see if the patron has um, reached that number of max holds already for the given policy. And it will also check to see if um, the item could transit to fill the hold based on the policy. So all of these things related to the patron, the item, and the hold policies, they're all being tested in the instant that the hold is placed, just to determine if a single item exists that could fill the hold, to give the patron that positive confirmation that their hold was placed or let them know that it can't. Okay, 
So at this point, we click place hold. Our patron sees that their hold was placed, and they're all good. We still have more to do on the evergreen side, though. So next, we're going to take a look at targeting and the potentials list. And our question here is, how is Evergreen identifying which items can fill this hold? So we have another diagram, and this is going to walk us through how Evergreen creates the potentials list. So our goal here for Evergreen is to identify all of the items that could fill a hold. And Evergreen is going to go through really much the same process that we just discussed when that hold was placed. However, at this point, Evergreen wants to build up a list of all of the items that could fill the hold versus just trying to quickly verify one item for hold eligibility. So we really have the same process. Um, hold targeting is triggered. Evergreen goes through and identifies all the potential items. Um, it's going to look at the boundaries again and the proximities and order all of the items by proximity. Then it is going to test all of those items in proximity order to create the potentials list. So it grabs from the first proximity level. Um, Evergreen is going to grab an item and test it. It runs those same eligibility checks. And if the item is determined to be eligible, it gets added to the potentials list. And Evergreen goes through and tests all of the items to determine each, each item that should go on that potential list. All right, so at the end of this process, we have our potentials list, which Andrea mentioned this, but you will also see that referred to as the hold copy. So at this point, with that potentials list, we know which items can fill the hold. We've got the full list. So how does Evergreen decide which item to place on the pull list, which is what we see in the staff interface? So with this diagram, we're starting from where we left off on the last one. We have our full potentials list. Evergreen sorts those items by proximity, and it starts by taking the item or items with the closest proximity. From that group, it is going to select a random item and it's going to perform a couple of tests. The first, moving over to the right-hand side here, is it checks to see if the item is in a status that is considered available. So in, in the item status configuration interface in, in server administration, there's that is available checkbox um, for each of our statuses. So we can determine if items in those statuses are available to fill holds, even if um, it's not in the status that's called available. So it checks for that. Um, if the item passes that test, if the status is available equivalent, then it goes to the next test. It checks to see if that item is already targeted for another hold. If it's not, if it passes both of those tests, then that item is targeted for the pull list. And that's what we see in the pull list. If the item fails either of those tests, Evergreen will go back and check to see if there are more items um, in the same proximity group or level. If there are, it'll go grab another item and go through the same process again until it finds an item to put on the pull list. If there are no more items in that proximity level, Evergreen will then check to see if there are items at any additional proximity levels that are further away proximity-wise. If there are, then it will take that group of items and perform the same tests for that proximity level, looking for an item that is in an available equivalent status and that is not already targeted. If it doesn't find one, if it doesn't find any item that passes those tests, then that is when the hold is left untargeted and um, you know, we'll still see it in the pull list, but there's no item targeted. So the target time is recorded 
So we do know when Evergreen checked for an item to fill the hole. Okay, so going back to what Andrea said about the hold myths, you know, the pull list is one place where we actually see some information about our holds in the staff interface. And there are a few pieces of information that we want to pass on to help us understand what we're seeing in this interface. Um, the pull list, it's not static. It essentially is a living document and it can change due to a variety of factors. Um, when an item is targeted for a hold, it's not locked in to fill any specific holes until the item is actually captured. The one exception here are copy or item level holds and force or recall holds. In those cases, those holds are placed on a specific item. Otherwise, um, that targeted item can and likely will change over time. Certain actions will result in the pull list being shuffled, such as when a new hold list is placed, excuse me, when a new hold is placed. Um, it could be when one hold captures another hold's target, manual retargeting by a staff member, and then the regular hold retargeting interval will also potentially cause the pull list and targeted items that we see there to change. So like Andrew was saying, the full potentials list really is a better representation of which items can fill a hold. The pull list itself is just a slicer of view of that potentials list at the time it's viewed. So while we're talking about targeting, let's talk a bit about retargeting as well, because it is happening on a regular basis. So we've just reviewed when Evergreen retargets. We did a little recap of that. Um, one important thing to note is that when holds are retargeted, they will be retargeted in the order that they were placed and older holds are retargeted first. So if we have 10 holds and holds one through six have been retargeted, holds seven through 10 will be the next up to be retargeted and they will need to be retargeted before hold number one is retargeted again. So Evergreen is just working its way down that list. Um, another thing to note is that if there are more holds placed on a title than there are items, then the same item may show up on the pull list again, even after retargeting, because it's, it's the only one that's really available. So what does Evergreen actually do during the retargeting process? Um, it records a few pieces of information. It records the last time the hold was targeted, the item and the circulating library of that item um, that was just targeted. And it also records the fail time, which is when the item was untargeted and it moved on to the next item. Evergreen then updates the potentials list and identifies a new item to target for the pull list. So it goes through those same processes again. Okay, so that takes us part of the way through our workflow. And we, we know we just went through a lot of information, so we want to pause for about five minutes for any questions. So I haven't had my eye on the chat box, but let's see. There's a couple in the chat box. Um, So I'll just read these for anyone uh, not uh, watching the chat. And so they will be uh, in the transcription as well. April Durrance asks, how and when does Evergreen consider the hold policies weights? Uh, and then she talks a little bit about how that happens in her uh, consortium with newly migrated libraries. And then the second question is, during initial can hold be placed checks, is there any checking evaluation of CERC eligibility? All right, so I um, I will take the uh, the second one first since it's easier. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, the uh, there are no 
Um, there are no circulation specific tests going on during the can hold be placed. There is a um, there's a column on the hold matrix match point table that um, is meant to be able to do this, but it's not exposed through the interface. And uh, we uh, will be talking a little bit more about that at the very end of uh, the presentation. Uh, April, for the, um, the policy weights, those are probably at least one, maybe two, um, pre-conference sessions of their own, um, but uh, the, uh, the, the hold policy weights uh, are taken into account. The details of how those work, um, it's, it's nuanced and would take uh, more time than we have uh, available today to go into uh, very deeply. But there are also ancillary settings, including some um, some old settings that uh, really should just be pruned out of, uh, out of Evergreen entirely that can't interact with the policy weight uh, mechanisms and cause them to uh, uh, to behave um, in ways that uh, they wouldn't were those settings older settings not set now. Um, the specifics of your consortium, um, it's, it's hard to say exactly what all the details are uh, or what, what all the behaviors would be without knowing all of the details of yours. Uh, but that would be a, um, a, 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 a great follow-up discussion perhaps on the, the mailing list or at a development meeting or in IRC um, in the uh, Evergreen channel. And I would uh, encourage you to bring it to one of those forums. And let's see, was there? We had um, another question or I guess comment, which is at the initial, there is an item check in 363. I'm seeing the place hold option for titles with no copies. Ends with high level hold has no copies, silent fail. And I'm seeing when manually retargeting a hold, what conditions would allow Evergreen to successfully abandon its original targeted copy to look for a new one? Oh, let me see. Let me think for a moment on the first one. Um, I, I, Lindsay, I, I do not have an answer for you off the top of my head on the high level holds has no copies, quite, uh, really the question uh, or a statement. I, I would need to go back and check the code and I've been told uh, in no uncertain terms by Andrea that I'm not allowed to do that live during the presentation. That's very true. <laughs> and uh, let's see here, Keith, when uh, manually retargeting, what conditions would allow successfully abandon the original target copy well the most um, important con condition would be that there is there is another copy that no other hold is targeting and that that copy um, is uh, uh, within the range of the requested hold for all of the various configuration settings including boundaries and transit distances and things like that so um, the, it, we would have to take a look at a specific, um, uh, the specific uh, instance to in order to, to know for sure. But having more copies would definitely allow that to, to happen. Thanks everyone for the great questions. We're going to move back to the slides and then we'll be pausing at additional points in time for more questions. Uh, all right, next. So, I will stick with you for a few more minutes. Thank you, uh, Andrea and Angela. Um, and now we're going to talk about the next part of the process of holds, which is holds cap hold capture. Uh, this is um, this is where Evergreen determines which hold an item should fill uh, when an item is scanned. And the reason we separated hold targeting from hold capture is because the whole targeting process. Uh, up to the point of targeting and the pull list is 
from the point of view of a hold looking at many copies, this is the point of view of a copy looking at many holds. Next. So the capture process uh, begins when an item is scanned into the hold capture interface or the check-in interface. Um, those are entirely equivalent at, uh, with regard to what Evergreen does uh, on the back end. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, all capture is opportunistic capture. Uh, we will be reiterating that throughout the, uh, the presentation. Uh, but when an item is scanned at hold capture or check-in, we first go and look at uh, the hold copy map to find all of the uh, potential holds this item could fill. That's the candidate hold list we, we discussed earlier that is a uh, newly minted term um, just for you at this presentation. Um, we take a look at the copy to determine, and, and the pickup library um, for that we're uh, acting at, or act, uh, that we're, rather the scan library that we're acting at. And we look up the best hold selection sort order. This uh, is uh, and the, uh, the cornerstone of figuring out which hold we're going to fill with this copy. We use the best hold selection sort order configuration uh, that was uh, I, that was specified for the for the context library, and we sort all of the holds on the candidate hold list by that uh, by the, the the best hold order. And then we look at each hold in turn. So each hold uh, we uh, perform uh, a test of eligibility. Uh, can this hold uh, be filled by this copy? This is uh, a lot of the same tests we've already performed, um, but we're, we're going back and making sure at this time when the item is scanned, can, can the, uh, the item fill that hold? And if it can fill that hold, then uh, we're done. We've checked one hold, we've very quickly returned to the user, and uh, we then uh, take a look and see whether or not where we're standing is the pickup library for the hold. If it is, then we uh, we we capture the we've already captured the item for the hold. We tell the, the we tell the staff member to place the item on the hold shelf, and uh, we move on. Um, however, if we're not at the pickup library for the hold, then we will need to uh, put the item into transit to the pickup library and let staff know about that. Now, if back when we were checking whether or not this hold can capture this item and we decided that uh, it can't, then we go back to the next hold in line and we perform the eligibility checks again. We will check up to 100 holds uh, in this process. Now, that's a, uh, a limit in the code intended to uh, keep the check-in process from stalling when uh, the staff member's standing there at the desk um, and uh, having check-ins take tens or more seconds uh, to, pr to uh, proceed. Uh, but the uh, best hold selection sort order is intended to put more likely holds at the front of the list uh, so that we are, in, in fact, um, oh, I wasn't quite ready, but that's fine. Uh, the best hold selection sort order is, is the intent is to make sure that um, items that, uh, or rather holds that this item could fill will be at the front of the line for the test uh, that we're going to tests we're going to apply and we'll catch one very early. Uh, next slide. Thank you. And that the uh, just to reiterate, this is the most important um, component of hold capture, uh, the best hold selection sort order, because it is asking what is important to your library when deciding which hold to fill uh, with a given copy in hand standing in your building. And we will be coming back to this again. Uh, next slide. So again, uh, just to reiterate, um, all capture is opportunistic capture. There is no such thing as capture that is spe specified wholly by the pull list. 
uh, the, pull, the hold that is next to the barcode on the pull list uh, does not necessarily, um, it will not necessarily be the hold that the item captures. The pull list is meant to get items off the shelf for capture, not to, to capture for a specific hold. And again, the cap, when we're looking at capture, this is, um, this is a process with a single copy looking at many holds and trying to determine which is the most appropriate hold to fill. Uh, and we, I mentioned that, that we only process 100 holds when looking at, uh, at uh, an item to capture a hold at scan time. And stalling um, can impact when and where capture uh, will happen. Uh, we will be talking more about that on the configuration slides so. now. Next. And questions for capture. There was one that we didn't quite um, get to at the end of the last question uh, block, which was from Jennifer. What is the best process when a pickup library needs to be changed? Um, for that, you know, you can edit that. I think uh, actually April, thank you, April. Let her know that's the action in the actions menu to change the pickup library. But then you uh, should also be able to tell that specific hold to um, find another target and that'll kind of make it go out and look again for um, another copy. Now, if the copy is already in transit, when um, when you change the, the pickup library, it's not necessarily, like, you know, you, it's not necessarily going to catch that midstream. So some, sometimes changing pickup library, depending on where the hold is in its process, um, is not an immediate thing. It'll, it'll, but it will catch up eventually and they'll get a copy. Um, are there other questions? comment I can agree with. Uh, Taryn says that the new staff catalog needs a more human readable error messages. I, I, I would advocate for more human readable error messages everywhere. Yeah, amen. Uh, absolutely, Taryn. And Elaine is giving us some, uh, some clues on the uh, high level hold has no copies. Um, settings uh, or uh, error message. Uh, Elaine, thank you. Um, I know that we will be seeing, I'm, I'm certain we will be seeing that on the mailing list or in IRC, and I will make a note of uh, the part related and um, org unit skipping pieces to, uh, to investigate when that comes back up. Thank you for that. Any other questions before we launch into our next section. Okay, well, we will have another couple of sec uh, question blocks uh, coming up. And if we have time at the end, we'll absolutely take more questions at the end as well. But since we are, um, astonishingly more or less on our predicted time schedule for this large slide deck. Let's just uh, keep rolling. So the next section is back to me um, and we're gonna talk about holds configuration. Um, and holds configuration can intersect uh, hold placement, it can intersect the potentials list and targeting, and it, it can intersect uh, hold capture. There are so many ways to configure holds. Um, there are options found in global flags, in library settings, um, otherwise known as Yausen, um, in various administrative interfaces. Um, they're not all in one place. Um, they're not all called the same thing. And like I said, they can influence the process um, at many different, uh, many different parts. Uh, next. So I'm gonna talk about um, boundaries uh, and proximity adjustments, and then I'll hand it off to Angela for age hold protection and policies. Next. So for boundaries, um, these are controlled by two Yausen, two library settings, a hard boundary and a soft boundary. So for a hold placed at um, you know, a depth of two, it will move up the tree looking for a, a local copy. If a local copy, or excuse me, if a local copy is not found, 
um, the hold will move up the tree. So you can see on the right, I've got the depths marked there, um, looking for new copies until it hits the hard boundary. Um, and the soft boundary sort of saying, like, try to keep things in this general area, but you can cross this line going up the tree if you need to. The hard boundary says when you're looking for copies, you can uh, never cross this line, even if a staff is placing the hold. So that's if you have a, the kind of system that has like wholly separate circulating org units that do not interact with each other, you would probably want to consider using hard boundaries. You just want to kind of try to keep holds um, down the tree first before moving up to the higher level org units. That's where you would want to use the soft boundary. Uh, next. And then um, the next configuration option that I'm going to talk about is proximity adjustment. And proximity adjustment is a way to tell Evergreen to consider a location either closer or further away from another location relative to their org, unit, their org tree positions. Now, earlier on, we talked about unadjusted proximity. Um, this is a way to change that. And this, uh, the proximity can be consulted at any point in the holds process. Um, it especially interacts with best hold selection, sort order, and age protection. Um, I'll go talk to you about both of the different kinds of proximity adjustment, which are absolute or relative. Um, and just so uh, one of the biggest things that was hardest for me to like internalize when I was first learning about proximity adjustment is it's it's two it, it, each each individual adjustment only goes in one direction. So if you need two locations to be relatively closer to each other, you need to set it in both directions. So you need to make a set for pick up library A and pick up li and you know pick up library B. So. And this is located in admin, server admin, or unit proximity adjustments. Uh, next. So just to revisit, this is our unadjusted proximity. You count each step up or down the org tree. So for a hold, and this is, this is based on pickup library. So for a hold that's being picked up at BR2, um, you can see that each one of the, uh, the red numbers indicate how far by unadjusted proximity each of those locations are from each other. So when uh, Angela and Mike were talking earlier about ordering by proximity. This is that unadjusted proximity. So based on um, distance from pickup library. Next slide. So the first uh, way to adjust this is an absolute adjustment. And only there's only a single absolute adjustment that will be consulted when evaluating holds. Um, so absolute adjustment is effectively replacing the unadjusted proximity that you saw on the previous slide, and it's giving it a new baseline value. Um, so in the next slide, you'll see where the, uh, in, in, the, in the admin interface where we configure this, there's a position field. And this position field tells Evergreen the order of absolute adjustments to be applied. Um, and then the lowest numbered absolute adjustment will be used if there are multiple matching adjustments. So a use case for this is if you have, say, a direct courier between BR1 and BR2. And so you therefore want to say BR1 is part of that distance equals one group. So you would create an absolute adjustment um, of one for items that are owned at BR1 with a pickup library of BR2. And this means that all else being equal, BR1 items will be targeted as often as the other um, proximity of the distant single distant uh, items uh, in your group. So next, please. And that's how this looks in the interface. Um, You've checked, I've checked the absolute adjustment box. I've said that my hold pickup library is BR2. My owning library is BR1. Um, position is zero and proximity adjustment is one. So you can also, as you can see in this, um, the record editor modal that I have a screenshot there up on the left, you can also um, in, put things in here like circ modifier, copy location, hold request library. There's lots of different ways to instruct Evergreen to use proximity adjustments. For simplicity's sake, we stuck um, just to this example, but it's all the same thing. The idea is replacing the default proximity and saying these, these two organizations are now this distance apart from each other. So in that case, that puts BR1, since we've said BR1 has a proximity of one for all holds picked up at BR2, that everything within that dashed red uh, circle has the same relative proximity, or the same proximity. OK, next, please. There's also relative proximity adjustment. So absolute says, this is, this is your new distance. Um, relative proximity says, increase or decrease the distance from A to B by this value. Um, a negative relative proximity will move an org unit closer, and a positive one will move it farther away. 
um, and multiple adjustments are additive. So unlike relative proximity or unlike absolute proximity, you can have several of them. Um, and therefore the position field is ignored. It still thinks that it's relevant. That's actually a bug we found while writing this presentation um, that we'll file Launchpad for if it's not in Launchpad. You, but the, you have to enter something in the position field, but it's effectively ignored. So that's an interface bug. And a use case here would be that let's say your SL1 is geographically distant and maybe your courier does not run to them as often. So we would want to target their items relatively less often for pickup at BR2. So in the next slide, next slide, please. Um, we give them a relative proximity adjustment of plus two, which means that their effective distance now from BR2 um, is three. So that kind of has the effect in terms of uh, targeting of pushing them a little bit farther away. And you can see that's how the configuration is um, on the left to result in the, the org tree that is showing on the right. OK, uh, next. And I think that's back to you. Yep, I think that comes back to me. All right, so age protection is also taken into account at the time of hold placement. Age protection is a time and location based configuration. So for libraries that share materials within a multi branch system or a multi library consortium. Age protection allows you to keep new items at home at the items owning library for a specific period of time. Um, to serve the owning libraries patrons first when that material is new. So. That period of time can be calculated from the item's creation date, and that's the default behavior in Evergreen. Um, Evergreen can also be configured to calculate that time from the item active date. And that is the date at which an item is first placed into a status that is considered active, such as the available status. Um, so whether you want to use the creation date or the item active date, that can be set in the library settings. You can also configure Evergreen to take the proximity adjustments that Andrea was just discussing um, into account when determining age protection. And this is relatively new, but a really, really good addition. Um, you only need to use this, though, if you are using custom proximity adjustments like we just saw. So the age hold protection rules, they are created in the admin module under server admin. And then once you have those rules, a specific rule can be applied or set in an item record to apply to a specific item. So Evergreen has two stock age protection rules. Um, you can also create custom age protection rules. But the two stock ones, we have three month and we have six month. The three month has a an allowed proximity of zero. So this means that these new items can only fill holds where the pickup library is the same as the item owning library for the first three months of that item's life at the library based on create date or active date, whichever you've chosen. The default behavior for the six month option, it has an allowed proximity of two. And so that is the, the dotted red line that we're looking at here. Um, that means that items, the new items can only fill holds where the pickup library is essentially anywhere within the system that the owning library belongs, um, belongs to. Now this could be the owning library itself. It can also be the parent org unit any child org units or sibling org units. So anywhere within that system for the first six months of its life. All right, moving on to hold policies. Um, I want to talk a little bit about hold policies today, but this will really just be an overview because hold policies could be a two hour presentation just on their own. Um, but hold policies are the rules that are configured in Evergreen to define who can place holds and on which materials. When we were looking at the workflow earlier, we saw that these hold policies are tested during each step of that process to ensure that that hold can be placed. 
the hold policy, the final hold policy that's used for a transaction um, is selected when the item is captured to fill a hold. And our hold policies can be based on a variety of different criteria related to our items, our users, and location-based information as well. The specifics of the policies really depend on your library's policies themselves. So we have the hold policies interface. It's found under local administration. This is just a screenshot of that, um, but you'll notice towards the top, you'll also see the hold policies referred to in some places as hold matrix match point configurations. So this is where we set up the policies, but for today, I wanna to talk a bit about how hold policies are actually selected. How does Evergreen decide which policy to use for a given hold? So Evergreen has a feature called hold match point weights. And these are the rules that Evergreen uses to determine which hold policy is the best match for a given hold. Now, depending upon how your hold policies are set up, it's very likely that there will actually be multiple hold policies that match a specific hold that's being placed. Um, for example, we might have an adult patron in the adult patron permission group placing hold on a book. Pretty straightforward. So your library might have a policy or the adult patron permission group placing a hold on items with the book CERC mod. And this transaction would match that policy. You might also have a generic kind of catch-all policy for adult permission group placing holds on any materials. And technically, this transaction, the adult, patron placing hold on a book, it matches both of those policies. So we need to give Evergreen a way to decide which policy is the better match. And it uses these hold match point weights to score each hold policy that it determines is a match and uses those scores to determine the best policy to use for the transaction. So the hold match point weights are configured in server administration. And on this slide, on the right-hand side, we have just a screenshot of the default weights. So Evergreen does have four stock hold match point weights. Um, sorry, I'm moving to the kind of the center of the slide here, but there's the default, which prioritizes item ownership and patron location. There's item owner first, user before requester, and all equal. Um, so here we're looking at the default weights. Each field that you see here represents a field in the hold policies. And we assign these fields a numeric value where the higher the number, the more weight or importance that field has when evaluating the hold policies. Now, you can create custom weights, but we do recommend trying the stock options that we have first. If you do try creating custom weights, you can always do that to test it out. Um, we also recommend that you not modify the stock weights, but create a new one and test using that. Um, there's nothing worse than changing the default weights and then forgetting that you changed them and you no longer know what the default is. So this is the interface where the weights are actually configured. Um, again, higher the number, the more weight. So here, requester permission group has the most weight. Now, there is another server administration interface called weights association. And this is where your library actually selects which of those hold match point weight rules you want to use at your library to evaluate and apply to hold transactions. Um, the weight rule is set per org unit. So this could be set at the consortium level and Parental inheritance does apply here. So if you set it at the consortium level, it will apply to all of the, the libraries in your Evergreen system. It can also be set at the system level or at the library or branch level. Now, if you take a look at your Evergreen system and you look at the weights association interface and you don't see anything set there, that's okay. That just means that you are using the default weights. It is the default. So, 
The Woods Association is where you select which of the rules that we want Evergreen to use to evaluate or hold policies. And that takes us to another question break. did just want to um, mention a couple of things and drop in a couple of promotions for other sessions because I am a uh, networker. So um, there is a conversation. Uh, Jeremy Miller has a bug that uh, con concerns the retargeting behavior when a patron changes the pickup library. And that is a launch pad bug 18666667. For those of you who may not be familiar with Launchpad and how to add heat to bugs that interest you, there is a session on that on Thursday at 1 p.m. in track two. And there was also a question specifically about the NC Cardinal uh, proximity settings. And I know we're not going to get into consortium uh, specific stuff here, but I did want to note that they are actually presenting on how they do that specifically in North Carolina tomorrow at four o'clock. So those are a couple of things that came up in the chat. Um, let's see, here's another one. Hold placement options. Which options cause related data to be stored in holds? In other words, which of the options can be changed on the fly without the need to update data in existing holds? I, I, I can grab that. I'll, I'll give um... A, uh, I'll give a, a general answer for that one. So anything that the patron has supplied or requested, that is if they've chosen different uh, notification options, those are pinned. Um, if they've made a meta record level uh, hold request and they've selected certain types uh, or, or formats or, or, or languages, then those are pinned as well. Um, the only thing that comes from the Oh, and also the pickup library, of course, is, is pinned. Uh, the, the, the patron or staff member would have to change that, and then we can go see Jeremy's bug um, to uh, get more information on that. But uh, there are there's there are two fields on the hold that are set during the initial um, targeting uh, that stick with that that hold for its lifetime. Uh, and changing policies won't change. Uh, how, uh, changing policies or configuration won't change that for a specific given hold uh, for its lifetime, and that is the selection OU. That that which is the same thing um, in all cases, unless you are doing something special in the database uh, as the pickup library, and that specifies which library we're going to start looking for copies at. The other one is selection depth, and that is set by the first run of the targeter um, based on how high up the tree uh, the targeter had to look to find a, a, at least one copy that this hold could target and uh, the uh, and where uh, a soft boundary uh, was set. Now, if there is a hard boundary set, that hold is going to get the hard boundary, period. Um, if there's no soft boundary. But if there's a soft boundary set and no hard boundary or the hard boundary is higher up the tree, then the soft boundary, uh, then the, the selection depth that it floated up to, if it happened across the, the soft boundary um, on its way up the tree, that will be recorded for that hold and that hold will not look further than that range uh, for its lifetime. Other holds, if you change the soft boundary setting, uh, other holds that come after that setting change will be changed. Um, but otherwise, uh, it, it's uh, um, it, it's all up to things that the staff member, if it was a staff placehold or the patron, if it was a patron placehold uh, supplied at the very beginning of the hold's life cycle. And policies can change underneath it and, and indeed impact which uh, items are considered as a potential item for that hold um, on future retargetings. And let's see, I did want to mention that the short answer to, um, to the question about whether or not uh, Evergreen can see 
proximity in the case of Hendersonville versus Raleigh? The short answer is yes, using proximity adjustment. Uh, what that's going to do is let you use a best hold selection sort order that considers adjusted proximity um, and um, have items from uh, adjusted closer locations uh, more likely be the hold uh, captured item or the, the capture item for holds uh, across those two uh, those two systems uh, that are configured to act like they're closer together. So it can be done. Um, any other questions on this section? And Andrea and and uh, Angela, if if uh, if I've um, said something you know to be false, please jump in and. Uh, let me know. From Jeremy. Um, oh, Jeremy. Okay. Jeremy, you can you can model geographic proximity with like relative and absolute proximity adjustments, um, but I do not recall hearing about an actual. There is a geographical proximity sort for the OPAC, which might be what you're thinking about, um, and that went in with. I should know this because I'm talking about it tomorrow, either 3.6 or 3.7, um, 3.7. And uh, that had, that's where you can sort copies um, based on like from the OPAC, you, when you're looking at a record, you can sort copies based on how far they are from the location you entered. And we have considered using um, a, a oh. third party service to enable um, geographic proximity calculations between uh, locations, uh, but, you know, time into it's wait well, for no man. It actually seems like that is what um, Benjamin uh, Murphy had pointed out that uh, Llewellyn will be talking about tomorrow um, oh, in NC Cardinal's presentation, so. Uh, well, I, 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 perfect, I spoke out of turn. <laughs> I, I look forward to it. Yeah, awesome. Any last questions? If not, I believe it is back to me for the beginning of the next section, which is potentials list or targeting time options. Um, next slide, please. We uh, will we'll be talking about three. The first of them is waiting. Uh, this is different than uh, then all of the other weightings in Evergreen, there's, uh, of course, the other hold-related weighting uh, that we've been talking about already. Uh, there's search-related weighting. Weighting is an overloaded term uh, in Evergreen, but this is, this allows you to uh, determine at targeting time how, uh, how likely it is a library will be the target of uh, of a specific hold by allowing you to inflate its uh, number of copies that get on the potentials list during the selection process, during the random item selection process. It's controlled by an or, a, a, a YAUS called or unit target weight. Uh, and what this does, uh, both, both uh, physically and logically, is it uh, it multiplies the number of times a, brand, a, a specific org unit's copies show up on the list, um, on the random uh, ordered list of items for a specific proximity uh, when, when we're going through the, the, um, the list of uh, proximities to find the closest copy for targeting. So again, we don't use all of the best hold selection sort order complicated algorithm to get an item into the pull list. We just look for the closest copy, um, uh, the closest uh, adjusted uh, proximity uh, copy. But if you have uh, a large library and you want to make sure that all your, uh, or the vast majority of your holds are filled by that, that large library because you have uh, very little transit um, coverage for your uh, satellite, small satellite libraries, you can increase the weight of that large branch uh, so that uh, its copies are on that list multiple times, giving them a, a higher possibility of being selected at random for any given hold. 
Uh, or if you do have great coverage, you can uh, increase the uh, apparent size of small branches uh, and make them uh, as likely as the large branch to show up as, as the, uh, the targeted, uh, show up as holding the targeted item for any given hold. Next slide. And, and uh, related to waiting, but um, uh, but having to do with uh, rather uh, rather having to do with uh, how many times we'll look at each library is looping. Now, uh, looping will happen generally if you if you have a setting uh, for the ordinate setting maximum library attempt uh, maximum library target attempt. The way Evergreen calculates this is that uh, if that setting is turned on um, it, for the pickup library, then it will take all of the potentials li potential item holding libraries and um, try to target an item at each one before going back to any of the ones it's already targeted. So you can think of it as uh, while it's not while it's not lining them up uh, in a specific order, it is creating a checklist and and uh, though randomly selecting, it is selecting items for each of the libraries that hold a copy uh, and checking it off a temporary list. And once it has uh, targeted an item at each of the potential library potential item holding libraries, uh, at least. Uh, in that round uh, and check that off, check them all off that temporary list, it uh, kind of forgets about that list and starts over with a new checklist. And it will do another round of attempting to find an item at each library on the list. And it will do that uh, up to the maximum library target attempts uh, number of cycles. Um, all right, next slide. And finally, we have a we have a, uh, settings that control whether or not your library will um, have an item targeted uh, for holds or any holds uh, when it is closed. Now there are two settings that control this. Uh, by default, Evergreen does not target libraries that are closed or items that are at libraries owned by libraries that are closed. But you can uh, you can use these two settings, and these two settings are not overlapping. Um, the first setting is target copies for a hold, even if copy circlib is closed. Uh, basically, that that just says uh, if I if I hold an item and uh, I'm but I'm closed, still include me in the list of libraries where you uh, will attempt to target directly the item and put it on a pull list. You would use this in situations where uh, you have a long, um, a long retargeting interval and libraries are closed across that gap or across the, that interval. Uh, you have libraries that are open, only open Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but you have a three-day retargeting, retargeting interval. You want to allow them to be targeted on Tuesday so that they can come in Wednesday and pull and uh, print the pull list and, and grab copies. Then there is a, a separate setting, target copies for hold, uh, even if copy circlib is closed, if the circlib is the hold pickup lib. And this is, the, this is like the previous setting we discussed, but it only takes effect if the library in question is the pickup library for that particular hold. You do not have to have the first setting turned on in order to use the second setting. Uh, or vice versa, they are uh, they are, they are separated. Um, let me just take a quick look. Um, Jeremy, thank you for the uh, information. We will uh, probably follow up in our next question uh, block with that as well. Um, but we're not there yet, uh, so I'll hand it over to Angela to talk some more about our favorite setting. Thanks, Mike. 
All right, so next we are going to take a look at the configuration options that affect hold capture. So here we are going to do a deep dive into best hold selection sort order. We'll recap those proximity adjustments again because they come into play here as well. And then we'll also take a look at how stalling can affect capture. So one thing I want to say before we get into best hold selection sort order is that because we have taken this presentation by looking at the different steps of the holds process, our slides are hippo coded. <laughs> They're not just there to be cute, but I, I hope you think they are cute. Um, so here <laughs> we have our hippo sitting on a pile of books. Anytime in the slides you see that hippo, that means that slide is about best hold selection sort order. So we hope that later on, if you're coming back to these slides for reference and you want to see all the different places sort order comes into play, you can look for the hippo and that might help you find the slides. Okay, so we already know from the previous slides that best hold selection sort order is used by Evergreen to determine which is the best hold to fill with a particular item when that item is, is scanned in and captured. So let's talk more about the criteria that Evergreen uses to select the hold and how they are configured. This is our configure interface for best hold selection sort order. And it is found in local administration. Just like most admin interfaces, you can double click on each row to view the sort order and make any changes to it. Evergreen does come pre-configured with seven stock sort orders to choose from. And as we mentioned, you can also create custom best hold selection sort orders. Um, it's good to test the stock ones first to see if they'll do what you want before creating new ones though. So you can see we do have two main categories of sort orders. We have traditional and FIFO um, with variations for each for prioritizing holds for your patrons. So within those two main categories, traditional prioritizes holds where the capture library is the same as the pickup library. And the goal of the traditional sort order is to reduce transits of materials and fill holds as quickly and efficiently as possible to get those materials to patrons as quickly as possible. This means that holds are not filled in the order that they were placed. Traditional is the default sort order in Evergreen. So if you go into the library settings and you check the best hold selection sort order to see what you're using, if you don't see anything there, that means you're using traditional. It's the default that's used even if nothing is set in that library setting. FIFO, as Andrea mentioned earlier, stands for first in, first out, and it prioritizes the hold request time, and it will fill holds in the order of request time. So this can increase the transit of materials and slow down hold fulfillment. Now we have all of those holds go home variations um, and sort orders to choose from as well. These sort orders prior prioritize holds for patrons whose home library is the same as the items owning library. And they can be used with traditional or FIFO with FIFO, this will lead to holds being filled out of the order that they were placed because we're going to prioritize holds um, at the patron's library. So the holds go home option, the holds go home sort order will always prioritize holds that have been, excuse me, that have been placed by patrons at the items owning library. So when an item is captured, if there is a hold that exists at that item's owning library, it will always go and transit back to its owning library to fill that hold next. Even if there's a hold at the capture library that it could have filled more quickly, which is what we would expect with traditional sort order. And even if the patron at the home library at the owning library is not the next person in line, which is what we would typically expect with FIFO. So it breaks those traditional I shouldn't say traditional, it breaks the stack expectations for what those two sort orders do. The holds go home sort order works in a very similar way, but it is time based. So if you use this option, it looks at the interval that's set in the library setting called max foreign circulation time. So let's say max foreign circulation time is set to three months. 
That means that items can transit anywhere in your system or consortium for three months to fill holds outside of its owning library. After three months though, if that item has not filled a hold for its owning library um, patrons within those three months, then that item will transit back to its owning library to fill in a hold for an owning library patron. So we let that item fill holds anywhere for a set period of time, but then we do want to pull it back to the owning library to make sure that the owning library's patrons are, are getting use of those materials. There's a relatively new option for sort order as well, which is traditional withholds chase home patrons. This prioritizes holds for patrons whose home library is the same as the item owning library, regardless of the pickup library that they've selected for their particular hold. So this sort order may be useful for library systems that resource share and allow patrons to pick up holds at any branch or library within the resource sharing um, system, but they want to ensure that their items are filling holds for their patrons first, regardless of where that patron wants to pick those materials up. <clears throat> So how does best hold selection sort order actually work? On the right-hand side of the screen here, we have a screenshot of the interface for a sort order. This is the traditional sort order. And in this interface, we can rank which criteria are most important for your library when taking a look at the holds and determining the order that they should be filled. So in this interface, the lower the number, the more important the criteria. If we've got a number one here, adjusted capture location to pick up library, that's saying that that's the first criteria we want to look at and sort by. Um, note that not all criteria need to be used. We don't need a number in each field here. Some fields will be left empty. And another important note is that the hold request time really is the tiebreaker for sorting holds it is the final ranking criteria for any sort order. Once we get down to sorting holds by request time, um, there's really nothing else after that that we can use to sort. So each of these fields here, we have a very wordy slide um, that describes what each of them are looking at. So I'm not gonna read this, but hopefully it's here for reference later on. Um, we do have a variety of different proximity measurements that can be used for calculating sort order. So we have things like capture library to pick up library proximity. We also have options that say adjusted proximity. Those would be taking any proximity adjustments into account. Uh, we also have things like hold cut in line state. That is looking at whether a hold has been set to the top of the queue. And that's something that staff can do manually in the staff interface. We also have hold priority, which looks at the hold priority field and permission groups. Talk a bit more about that in a moment. We have that hold request time, which is that final sorting criteria. So let's take a closer look at how sort order works. And we have an example here that we can walk through. So we have a sample best hold selection sort order that will rank holds by cut in line, whether the holds have been pushed to the top of the queue. It will then look at adjusted circulation library to pick up library proximity. And lastly, it'll look at the request time, our final sort option. So in this example and this diagram, we have an item and it's being captured. Evergreen finds that it can fill these seven candidate holds, and we're going to use this best hold selection sort order to determine which is the best hold to fill with the item. So we start by taking that first criteria, cut in line, and Evergreen sorts the holds based on that information. So in this example, cut in line, Evergreen has identified two holds, holds B and C, that had been pushed to the top of the holds queue. The other five holds have not. So based on that, we can tell that holds B and C have priority due to their cut in line status. They 
are better holds to fill with this item. However, we don't know between B and C which is a better hold, and we also don't know how to rank those other five. So for that, we go to the next criteria in the sort order. And here we're looking at proximity. So Evergreen identifies the proximity for the holds and it sorts them based on that proximity. Um, note that this is nested. So the holds are sorted by proximity within the order that was previously established by the cut and line criteria. So for the two holds that do have the cut in line status, hold B has a proximity of zero and hold C has a proximity of two. So based on cut in line and proximity, we can tell that hold B is the best hold to fill, hold C is the second after that, and going further down looking at proximity, we can also see that within the group of holds that does not have cut in line, hold G is the only one that has a proximity of zero. So that is the third best hold to fill there. We can also tell that after that, it'll be either holds E or F. They both have a proximity of two, but beyond that, we still don't know which would be the better hold to fill. And after that, we would be looking at the proximity for group, holds A and D, but within those two, we also still don't know which would be a better hold to fill. So we need a tiebreaker, and that takes us to our third criteria in the sort order, which is the request time. And again, we're still looking at this nested. Um, so for the request time, if we're looking at group, excuse me, if we're looking at holds F and E, we can see in this example, hold F was placed before hold E. So their order has switched and they would be filled in that order and hold D was placed before hold A. So that also gives us the order within the proximity level for hold group. So based on that best hold selection sort order of looking at cut in line first, proximity second, and request time third, we have the final hold order at capture time here. All right. Thanks, Angela. Um, I think it's still me. Is it still you? My bad. So. I'm really bad at reading the speaker chart. I'm sorry. No, I think I grabbed this one at the end. Oh, that's right. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so when we were looking at all those criteria for the best hold selection sort orders, one of those was group priority. And that field is referencing the permission group interface in server admin. One of the options that we see in the configuration there is hold priority. Um, and this just tells Evergreen to prioritize certain permission groups for hold fulfillment. Um, in this interface, the lower the number, the higher priority. So if you wanted to give preference to certain patron groups um, to have their holds filled first, you would probably just bump up all the other groups hold priority to two like we see here. Okay, now over to Andrea. All right, um, this, is, this is one of those times where I feel like I need a third monitor. But anyway, um, so back to proximity adjustment. Uh, as Angelo was talking about during the best hold selection sort order, there are a few different ways in which best hold selection sort order looks at uh, proximity, both adjusted proximity and default, i.e. unadjusted proximity. Um, so just the top of the slide is a quick reminder of what those different terms are. And then during capture, you can um, consider any of those, any or all of those four criteria. Um, and these are all weighted. So if, if you want to set one of these to be more important and the others to be less important, you would do that in numerical, the other numerical weightings in best hold selection sort order. Um, so that is just, just a reminder of how proximity adjustment, when you've made these changes, telling Evergreen to consider your locations closer or farther away, that's how they will intersect with best hold selection sort order. Okay. 
Uh, next slide. And then um, another option for the potentials list in targeting time is, is stalling. So stalling is controlled by a YAUS owned at the pickup library um, and it's soft stalling interval, which tells Evergreen to wait however many number of days you put in that setting. Uh, Evergreen will wait before it allows opportunistic capture at a library other than the pickup library. Um, so this is useful if you have a lot of copies at a lot of locations, but only a few holds. Um, so let's say you set soft stalling to be three days. That means Evergreen will wait three days before capturing an item that has not been specifically targeted or is not at the pickup location. So in effect, it would give that uh, people at the give that pickup location more time to um, fill that hold either from the pull list or from opportunistic capture. And I think that brings us up to our next question block. Um, I tried to grab a bunch of them off of the chat while you and Mike were speaking, and now I've lost that. There it is. So in order, um, Michelle asked, uh, we have used existing options for closed libraries, but have often had the need to prevent holds from pickup at the closed libraries from capturing and traveling to the closed libraries. Um, are there any options to prevent capture of holds for pickup at the closed library? Um, and I did answer that uh, in chat, but I'll, okay, I'll cool. repeat here. Uh, the you. short answer is that no, there's no way to temporarily keep an item from being captured for a hold when the pickup library is closed. Okay. But that uh, doesn't seem like particularly large development, so. Uh, that might be something to uh, bring up at a development meeting or uh, talk to your your friendly local developer about, or non-local. Um, go ahead, Andrew. You had, you had, did you have more cataloged? Mm, nope. If that's, that's finished with that one, I was going to move on to the next one, okay. um, which was from April. Um, which is the exact crit what is the exact criteria for traditional um, VHSS? So it's I actually have to go look at the screenshot we took, but it's just the default weighting um, of yeah, Angela it looks like Angela's gonna back up to that slide. Thank you. Um, there, if you can see that. So those are all ranked. And so the lowest number is the most important number. So here um, I can have a hard time. Oh, so adjusted capture location to pick up library location proximity is is that number one or is number seven? Mm, this is number one. Okay. Adjusted capture location. And then it's capture lib to pick up lib, adjusted lib to pick up lib, hold priority, cut in line, hold selection depth, request time. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. is the stock. We we just got this out of a stock demo system. So that's what the stock version of traditional BHSSO that is in Evergreen. Um, so April asked, oh, she answered this in chat too. So uh, previous question, Remike's discussion of branch waiting. Can this branch waiting be limited to holds where the pickup location was within the system versus having a library's items be targeted more often to fill holds for the whole consortium? And the answer that, Mike answered that in chat as, the pickup library is the context org for this setting because it's the most stable and process relevant org available. Copy related orgs can't contribute or be the context because in this stage, we're still considering one hold to many copies. And I will say that I'm not certain that I actually answered your question, April. Um, I hope I gave you some context to think about it. Um, but I think we may, this may, uh, this may take a little more nuanced discussion to, to, uh, uh, understand exactly what you're wanting to do um, with consortial versus local um, um, changes to how to the behavior of, of the um, targeting time. And again, this is just targeting time. Remember, the pull list is pull list is not canonical. Um, I like to say the pull list is a lie. Um, I, I think that Andrea and Angela would prefer I didn't say those exact words, but uh, it's meant to get an item in front of a scanner 
so that it can get out to a patron um, more than this the particular targeting okay. um, of, a, of a copy for a hold, a specific copy for a specific hold. Um, okay. I, I think there was one more, or are we getting short on time? Um, we have just under a minute in this question, Black. Diane asked about Holds Chase Home Library, mm -hmm. which is um, the new newest best hold selection sort order option. Um, so that is that is going to prioritize holds for patrons whose home library, so the patron home library is, is the same as the item only library. So that's going to be that top weighted BHSSO criteria. So this would be useful for library systems um, that maybe want to prioritize their own patrons um, to pick up holds regardless of where that patron uh, picks up the holds. So they want their items to fill holds to prioritize holds for their patrons independent of the pickup location, um, which older BHSSO options did not allow that as an op to the relationship there to be an option. So that's just saying my patrons get my items first, regardless of where my patron picks up that item. Um, let's see. And that's our five minutes. So I will grab the rest of the questions. Um, and we'll come back to them at the end. So. All right, and I think I actually start this next section. So there are a few other hold related features that we wanted to mention um, that don't really fall into the normal workflow. So one of those are hold driven recalls. Um, hold driven recalls are a feature that allows you to recall an item from an active circulation if another hold is placed on it by another patron. So these types of recalls are typically used in academic libraries where materials might be checked out for months or years at a time. Uh, this feature is entirely configured in the library settings editor. There is a group category called recalls and it has these three settings. Um, how this works is for circulation, circulation duration that triggers a recall, this is where you can set um, a circulation duration length where it, if a hold is placed and the item in circulation has a remaining circulation duration that is greater than the length that you've set, it will trigger a recall on that item. The next one, truncated loan period, this is the adjusted loan period that will be applied to the original circulation to give that first patron enough time and notice to return the material to the library. Um, there is a notice in notifications and action triggers called item recall email notice. So you can set, set that up to send the original patron an email saying, hey, you have to bring this back. And then the last setting is called an array of fine amount, fine interval, and maximum fine. So this is where you, you do just that. You set up a fine amount, a fine interval, and a maximum fine amount for that original circulation. So if that original user does not return the materials in the time allotted based on that truncated loan period, then they will be charged the fines that are specified here. And you can see um, in the slide, this needs to be formatted in a specific way, just like you see within brackets and commas between each, each field in the array. And back over to Andrea. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we're already also kind of in uh, a bonus time. Little inside baseball is that we realized if we spent way too much time on our front matter, we were going to run out of time. So this was uh, the line at which we were like, we'll get to this if we can. So I'm happy that we're able to talk to you guys about this stuff too. So hopeless holds is a relatively new feature. Um, it gives a local admin interface for resolving holds requests that, um, so when hold request was placed, it obviously there were valid copies available, but as time went on, perhaps all of those copies um, became that were once available, either became unavailable or um, any potential items that could fill the hold are in a status that has been designated as 
hopeless prone, which was another part of this work to add um, a field on item status where you could say, an item in this status, even if it's not technically hopeless, it's very likely to be hopeless, like maybe long overdue or something. Um, so let's go ahead and say that any item in that status is hopeless prone. So when the whole targeter runs and there are all the uh, potential items that could fill the hold are not there. So there are either no items available to fill the hold request or all any items that could fill the request are in that hopeless prone state. It gives it, um, Evergreens will give that a new hopeless state and then when that hopeless state field is populated, it puts it into the hopeless holds interface. And then there on in the hopeless holds interface, which uh, next slide, there is, it will populate this admin interface with your holds that have a hopeless state on them. And then you'll be able to take certain actions from this interface, including uh, transferring holds to another title. Um, if you use acquisitions, you can add them to a selection list, do an order from here. You can retrieve the patron, um, see if you can want to contact the patron about that. Um, so that just gives you a way to, to proactively manage uh, holds that had were valid at, at hold request time, but at some point or another, you ran out of copies for them. It gives you a way to fix that. Uh, next slide. And then in the uh, item status configuration interface, this is where that new um, prone to hopeless uh, hopeless prone state um, Boolean field has been added. So you can set that independently for each of your statuses. And what that does is say, you know, even if, if an item is in this copy or in this status, we can consider it as a, a hopeless copy. Okay. And then I think, Mike, you're up for hold groups. That is me. All right, this is new in 3.7. This is, uh, this, I, I worked on this code, so um, you, can, you can blame me um, for any deficiencies or credit me for any uh, fancy new use cases you, can, you come up with. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, the, this is hold groups, or as we were calling it while we were developing it, but developing it subscription holds. Um, the idea here is that staff can create uh, lists of users and users can, uh, if, if those uh, user lists are uh, marked as public by the staff, then the patrons can see that they are in such a list and uh, opt out of them, in fact. Um, and what happens with the way these uh, patron lists are used or user lists are used is that in certain uh, interfaces in the staff placeholder interface, and in specialized interfaces that deal with group uh, with hold groups, um, the staff members can place a, a title level hold for all members, um, all patrons uh, that are in that particular user list or user bucket. Um, the uh, the holds are placed all uh, at about the same time, but uh, there is a there is a setting that will allow those to be randomized for any given hold placement so that if you have a list of 100 users that really want to get a, the earliest hold on the next Daniel Steele as soon as it's been cataloged and staff uh, have a process in place to go and um, make that happen, you, you choose your Daniel Steele um, hold group and you place a hold for all those patrons, they will be done in a random order for that particular hold so that the first person in, in line um, for the holds in request order uh, is not always the same one uh, every time a new book is released um, for that, that hold group. Uh, there are settings for sending notices to patrons, um, action trigger notification, uh, settings for sending out um, hold group specific notices to patrons when they've had a hold placed for them. And this is available uh, for patron level management uh, in the other menu on the patron, uh, on the patron detail page uh, under, uh, listed under hold groups. So that's where staff can remove users from groups. Uh, the ability to add users to groups is sprinkled in several areas. One of them is in patron search um, there, there is, as I said, a uh, purpose-specific 
interface for both managing the hold, the members of the hold groups and the um, placing of holds uh, that uh, um, that will go out to all of the members of the group. Um, next slide. And then the fun part. There are bits and pieces of ever, evergreen code that uh, either no longer do anything or never did anything, uh, and they're related to holds, and we wanted to, uh, to go through some of those. Um, so one of them uh, we mentioned earlier, and I, 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 I want to come back after, in our last question block um, to cover something else related to the, the uh, waiting. Um, so uh, uh, I believe it was April was asking about that. Yes, so I'll come back to that in a minute. But there's a, an adjacent setting for the, for the hold waiting um, or the, the, uh, the target waiting that's uh, called use weight-based hold targeting. Uh, that was originally um, intended to allow you to, to or to require you to first turn on weight-based hold targeting and then go look up the weights. We no longer do that. Uh, we just look at the weights. Uh, so if your library has a weight, it will be reflected uh, in the number of copies that are on the potentials random list for targeting. There's right at targeting time. Uh, holds a uh, hard stalling interval. Um, when we first developed the soft stalling, we thought, oh, well, maybe there's a, um, a mechanism that we can call hold st hard stalling that will be similar to it, but work in a slightly different way. We decided that wasn't going to happen, uh, but we had already created the, the YAUS uh, hard stalling interval, and we just haven't gotten rid of it yet. Uh, so you can entirely ignore that setting. Uh, there is a setting for FIFO. Um, don't use it, please. Just please use the best hold selection sort order. We attempt to honor your selection of that, um, your, uh, your use of that setting. Um, but the best hold selection sort order is the, the modern way to do what you want to do, uh, and it will work out better for you. You have more control, and it will interact better with uh, other libraries using other best hold selection sort orders. And just to be extra super special clear, sorry to interrupt you, Mike. He's mm -hmm. referring to the, the FIFO library setting. So yes. this is in library settings editor. There is one that says use FIFO, true, false. Don't Just don't use that one. Yes, please. Please don't. And then this I mentioned early on. There is a stop, stop blocked users flag on the hold matrix. It's possible that earlier um, Ver in, in, uh, earlier versions of the um, of the hold matrix configuration interface uh, gave you access to that. The current one does not, and I did not find any in my in a quick scan. I did not find any uh, uses of that um, in uh, out in the world. So you can ignore that. It may be in documentation. Um, it would be nice to be able to bring that back, uh, but uh, the it, right now that uh, is not accessible. If it were, it would stop users from being able to place holds if they're if they had a circulation blocking penalty. And that's it for me for my slides for this part. Yeah, I think I get to, to bring us home. And y'all, we are in the home stretch. Um, so great job sticking with us. Um, I'm really, really happy to see that, that that attendee count kind of stuck in the 60s and we didn't just lose you all completely. Um, so in conclusion, yes, holds are still hard. And like the three of us really deeply, profoundly understand that even more so now than we did before. Um, so don't, if you get frustrated or find yourself understanding things and holds even, a, even after this, it's a lot. There's a lot of things that can interact with holds. Um, however, there's also a lot of ways that Evergreen's default mode or stock options um, can handle a lot of different kinds of, of, of ways of sorting holds. So maybe, especially if you're in a fairly standard consortium where you're sharing things relatively evenly, see if those work for you before you get really 
into configuration. Um, and a lot of these adjustments that we talked about, like the ones where we could draw pictures of them, we did uh, for you. But a lot of these can be very difficult to model abstractly, especially when you in, put in put them in the realities of, say, like the physical transit of items, like with your couriers and with your patrons, and open and close. Da, da, da. So be open to experimentation. Um, you know, if, if you model something, it doesn't quite work. Be open to adjusting that as you go. Um, remember that a lot of these things we talked about, we specified pretty much all the ones where they weren't. But a lot of times when you're looking at a whole base configuration option, um, most of the time it's considering things first from the perspective of where is that hold going to be picked up? So what is the hold pickup location? Um, and again, by default, Evergreen is just going to try to fill as many holds as possible, as fast as possible, just like a hungry, hungry hippo. So all comes around. Um, next slide. There is not a lot of community documentation uh, out there about this, this stuff. Um, I have linked here what is in the existing community documentation right now. Um, I make no promises about the current accuracy of it, but as a follow-up, we're going to be attempting to put some of our content from this presentation back into the community documentation and updating that community documentation so that this information is out there um, for all of us. You know, a lot of the content of this presentation um, kind of came directly from from Mike's brain as transcribed uh, and put into slides by myself and Angela. So we're going to try to make sure that that makes it into the community documentation. Um, next. And thank you for surviving this presentation. We put a link for a cute hippo video for you, which um, Angela, do you want to play the cute hippo video? Yes, it's very adorable. I really, really do. Yeah, so this is us celebrating the end of the presentation. This is Fiona the hippo from the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, we do have just a couple minutes um, where we can come back to some questions. Um, but we'll try to crack through them very quickly because we are coming up on our, our two hours and our faithful captioner probably wants to give her hands a break. So if I may, I just wanted to jump back to April's question about waiting. Uh, I, I did miss. I did misunderstand exactly what you were saying, April, and I apologize. If the 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 um, copies, I uh, the copies home library is what determines how many times it, it will be listed on the potentials list during the uh, random item selection. Now, given that. Any set of libraries um, that are within a system are generally going to be um, at about the same proximity from any other library outside of the system. Uh, you shouldn't need to worry too much about uh, whether um, the uh, whether the hold is coming from outside um, or or from inside the system because the since the copy is defining the copies. Um, Circlib is defining how many times that copy shows up on the list. Um, it will, um, and it will be peered with um, sibling libraries uh, or any hold. Um, it'll be balanced across the system for any hold, re regardless of where the the pickup library for that hold is. Uh, so that that should be the behavior you see. It shouldn't. Um, you shouldn't need to make a distinction with regard to uh, the pickup library for the um, the the uh, copy copy multiplication setting. Okay. There were um, a call. There's one other question from April. Um, if a system in the consortium are not the owning or circ library for items. Does proximity say that any item in the system or consortium is equally eligible to fill the hold? Um, that's a good question. I'm actually not sure. That does sound true to me, but I'm not certain. Mike, do you? So the system in the consortium are not owning or circ library. Proximity doesn't. Um, this was, let me scroll so you can see it in context. It was 23 minutes ago in the chat. Um, 
Not necessarily. Short answer, Mike. Yes. Yeah, short answer is uh, yeah, pretty much. Now, if you have proximity adjustments, that's where you can change that, right? So you can say two systems are closer together. Um, that's And that's where you might want to use that. Um, specifically, so if you have two systems that are next to each other and are resource sharing and have the same courier, give the system level um, pickup and uh, item owning settings a, a, a shorter relative, a small, uh, give it a, a, a negative relative adjustment to bring them closer together so that they're, they're uh, more likely to be the supplier, the mutual supplier. But like Andrea said, you have to set, do one in each direction for pickup and owning. Okay. Thank you. There is also a question from Catherine. Does max foreign circulation time restart after each instance of the item going out for a hold after it has returned home? Yes, there are two. Well, there are two parts to that. One is uh, has ever been back home, and there's and then there's a um, has circulated at home. So if it and in either case, it does reset. So it looks at the most recent time value for the last circulation when it was at its home or for the has ever been home, uh, the last time it, it either circulated or transited back into its home. So if, if the destination of a um, transit was the home library, then that's the, the, the uh, received time of that transit is the most recent um, time for the has ever been uh, or has been back for any reason version of that. Cool. Um, I saw that you got Ryan's question about recall versus hold recall in the chat. Um, Elizabeth asked, um, does hopeless, hold pull, hopeless holds pull in suspended holds that have been suspended for a set period of time? For example, a patron puts a hold on something, suspends it, a few years go by and they never reactivate it and their privilege expiration date has long passed. As far as I know, um, hopeless holds is only looking at active holds because those are the only holds that are going to be actively looking for to have copies populated in holds copy map. Um, if Mike, if you know to the contrary with, um, you know, speak up, but that is my, my, I do not think that hopeless holds considers, I think it only considers active holds. I, I believe that is correct. The um, hope, uh, suspended holds m won't have their most recent potentials list flushed, um, but that doesn't. That's just so that we can ha we can include them in a sort of a queue. Um, but the uh, but yes, the, the active holds are the only ones that that, that we care about for yeah. hopeless. And then thank you. That was. My understanding as well. Um, last question from Diane: If you force a hold, oh wait, uh, if you force a hold on an age-protected item, will the hold activate when age protection falls off? Well, that's a good question. I don't know if that is that is that an overridable event to force a hold over uh, age protection. I guess it is. So how does that work? I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> I'd have to test. Um, Sorry, I'm looking for that in context that you were breaking up a little bit, Andrea. So oh, it's just four, it was four minutes ago from Diane. It's, it's, Yes, Diane, if you, if staff member um, forces the hold to go through, uh, the hold will, uh, the hold will be active the whole time. It just may not be able to capture anything until the, until the uh, age protection has expired on copies that um, would otherwise be available to fill it. I want to say thank you so much to our presenters today. That was an excellent and perfect for a pre-conference session because it's such a deep topic and I think we could do a whole week on it and, and not necessarily be finished. So this was 
a delightful way to look at that. I also want to just mention again, a thanks to our platform sponsor, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative and Mobius for sponsoring our captioning today, which has been delightful. Uh, and then Cool, the Consortium of Ohio Libraries for sponsoring the pre-conferences in general. There are a couple more bugs that were mentioned. And so please feel free to scroll back up through the chat and grab those if any of those are of interest to you. Um, the chat shouldn't close out. It should keep running through the next session in, tra in uh, track two if anyone needs to grab those. And uh, there are uh, the slides I'm sure will be on the conference website here within a couple of days after we get finished. And then the once there are processed and everything, the video and all the wonderful Q&A will also be hosted on YouTube and that will be linked from the conference website as well. So you can come back and revisit this whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here today. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone and thanks Katie for being a good host.